God didn't create Cody with cancer in his own. So trust me, let him belong there. Has no right, has no authority to do that. And we take the authority that's been given to us over it. And we speak it wrong. In Jesus' name. Healing. Lord, whatever you have to do with God, so let it be done. Lord, to repair this one. Lord, to give a new one. Lord, there's nothing beyond your power. We give you the praise in Jesus' name. Are you saved? So we 
we had to look at a few words and we talked about uh, all authority that's been given unto Christ, both in heaven and earth, and as he is seated up in heaven, he releases that authority to you and I and to his church. And then he punctuates it by the power of the Holy Spirit that came into your life the moment you received him as Lord and Savior. But it has to be operated through energy, which is you and me, doing something with the power that God has given us by the authority that we have in him. Today I want to look at one other thought that may seem, uh, what's that got to do with the type thing? But the more I looked at it, the more I was researching, and the more I was spending time uh, preparing, the more I began to realize maybe this is a real true key as well. So this morning I want to talk to you about what does it mean to be made in the image of God. Maybe somewhere along the road we've missed something. So I want to look at the image of God. Mass shooting, redefining marriage, killing of innocent children, all kinds of agendas uh, that are infiltrating every aspect of our life. What in the world is going on? And I believe that in many cases the pulpit is to blame. Or if you do not hear it from the pulpit, then the enemy has a way of making us feel that it's really not all that important. And it doesn't really matter. I mean, the preacher never talks about it. So surely, it, it can't be that big of a deal. Maybe a lot of our problems is because we have been silent in the pulpit. Sam Austin made a, made a statement many years ago, uh, and his statement was very emphatic. He said, I would rather have six horse thieves in my town than one preacher, because one preacher stirs up more problems than all the horse thieves do. I don't believe we stir up any kind of problems hardly anymore in the church. We're satisfied with being who we are, where we are, when we are, and we just soon lock all four of the doors we're hiring. Lock all of the doors and sit in here until the Lord returns and never cause a stir. I'm telling you, we're going to have to start causing a stir in our society. Our, our society is going to overtake us and try to silence us. There's a very troubling trend in the evangelical church today as a whole. We are in a desperate need of genuine leadership in the church. Broken people, broken leaders, humble leaders who are not afraid to admit that they need God more than they need the accolades of man. Need God. And it's got to start right here, behind this pulpit. Not only in River of Life, but in churches all around the country. we got to have men of God. We're worried about prayer. Not concerned about our status and our recognition. Men who will petition God rather than position themselves. I don't need a position. I'm called of God. I remember when I left my one organization years ago and uh, I turned my ordination papers back into them because God was leading in a different direction. And there was a period of time and, uh, that I wasn't licensed to preach. Do you think that stopped me from preaching? Because I didn't have a piece of paper? No. I preached just as hard then as I, I did before. And, and even later when I received my credentials from the, the, another organization, I continued preaching. The, the call of God is in our heart and in our life. The call of God is not on a piece of paper hanging on the walls. It's not a matter of how many degrees we might have or, or might not have. That's totally irrelevant. It's when God calls you and chooses you and puts his hand upon you and says, my son, my daughter, I'm going to use you to make a difference in the lives of people. I'm going to use you to be my mouthpiece. And Lindsay, I'm going to speak through you to my people when you will release yourself to me. Watch what I'm going to do. I'm going to bless my people through those that are in a praise and worship when we surrender that which we're called to do and give it unto God. It's not about position. Today the truth is often neglected, watered down, or avoided altogether in the hope of not offending somebody. Rather, I would like to build a large congregation. 
foundation. I would love this building to be packed solid. I would love for the men to come to me and say, Brother Paul, after the last six months of not having any room whatsoever, people hanging on the staircases and everything else, I think we need a brand new building. Well, I'm all for that. Praise God. Let's go find us 25 acres or something. Let's get us a big campus. I want that, but I'm not going to do it in compromising the Word of God. I'm not going to do it jeopardizing the lives of our children and our teenagers, our youth. I'm not going to do that. Because whether you believe it or not, one day, according to the scriptures, I've got to stand before God and I've got to give an account for every word that I've ever spoken. Now, you go home and think about that. You think about giving an account for every word that you've ever spoken in your life. Yeah, isn't that enough? Scripture says I have to give an account. So I'm going to share the word. Judgment is never mentioned in our churches today. Repentance is not sought. Sin is often excused. We want to build a church rather than break a heart. We want to be politically correct rather than biblically correct. We want to coddle, we want to comfort rather than to stir and convict. When I was a young boy growing up in church. I've told you this before. Please, if you're on the back row, this is not meant for you. All right? I'm looking at the back row. I don't know what it's when I was on the when I was growing up, the back row was reserved for those that did not necessarily have a relationship with God, and they would come to church, and the convicting power of God would be so strong, they had two choices. Either they got up, came down to the front, gave their heart to the Lord, or they got up and they went outside, because the power of God was so convicting, you could not just sit. They had to do something, because this power was so strong. The day when you come to church and spend an hour, two hours, and go home totally unchanged and unfaithful. But what was said or what was done. When a country loses its sense of honor, it also loses its sense of shame. Such a culture, sin just becomes an error of judgment, mistakes, boo-boos, and God is entirely taken out of the equation. Because make no mistake, sin are always against God. Whoever else they may also be against or do harm to, they are against God. When a culture replaces the value of everlasting life with the value of this life, extended as far as possible, the culture has become totally unable to see beyond the immediate, the tangible, and oddly enough, when the life that this life is all there is, is believed, it makes it much easier to allow death to rule in one's mind, one's fear, and one's behavior. Death simply becomes the price of doing business or surviving. The culture becomes fear-based and makes decisions on the basis of fear rather than faith and a belief in the life that is to come. We have become a culture of death. Our society has become a culture of death. I shared with you last week uh, in the United Kingdom, they, there was an article that came out and they said that 81, 82% of all young people between the ages of 16 and 28 felt like there was no purpose in life. There, there was no purpose in living this life. Can you imagine what the enemy does with things like that? No wonder we have an increase of suicide. No wonder people are hopeless. No wonder people don't want to get jobs. No, no wonder that we're in a situation where we're in if we feel like there's nothing in this life and it's hopeless and we're just drifting through it. Hey, let's get the pain over with as soon as we possibly can and be done with it. After all, when I die, I'm going to go in the ground and someone's going to throw dirt on me and it's all over with. No, it's not over with. It's not the end. It's only the beginning. Because now you're faced with eternity. And 
you've got to do something with eternity. Another problem that we're facing in our country, and I'm going to get to my scripture in just a moment. I'm just laying a foundation, okay, so I can get there. Another problem in America, he, uh, Billy, uh, not Billy Graham, but Franklin Daniel was making this statement. He said that Christianity is constantly under siege from the halls of government and education, which seeks to suppress any public expression of faith. We all know what's going on in our educational system. We know what's going on in our government. We realize that Christianity is under an attack. And for some reason, we think, oh, it's all going to work out. I'm going to heaven. I hope you want to go with me. I, I want to spend eternity with you. I'm grateful that I get a, an opportunity to spend some time with you here on this earth. But I'm looking forward to, to just looking at your good old smiling faces uh, forever. And to be with you in heaven. In places like Europe where Christianity has been in the decline as the deceptive forces of secularism, materialism have spread across the continent, it's not surprising to find that the practice of euthanasia has become so entrenched. Earlier this year in Belgium, Belgium became the first country in the world to allow child euthanasia with no age limit. I thought this was only for those that were dying of terminal diseases that we were going to be merciful unto them and we were going to be compassionate unto them and we were going to let them terminate their lives and, and just let it be done. But now it's not just those that are old, those with terminal disease. Now it's, it's even children with no age on it. But somebody says, well, I just don't think that they're going to have a quality of life. And who's going to determine that quality of life? See, Jesus determined it for you and I. He said that your life is valuable. It's so valuable that I was willing to go to the cross and die on the cross for you and for your life. That's how important you are. That's how valuable you are. Jesus says, what would it gain a man if he would gain the entire world and lose his own soul? I'm telling you that your soul is worth more than all the riches in heaven. But man comes and man says, well, I don't think that your life is not a whole lot of value. Listen, you're handicapped in this way. You're handicapped in that way. You're not as smart as this other group is or, or whatever it might be. And we determine that, that you're really not of any value. So we're going to make a decision to eliminate you. A man would never do that. Are you kidding me? Do you know that during World War II, one of the things that the doctors were doing and I'm looking around this building, and I, I better get a whole bunch of amens out of this, all right? They were trying to determine those who had to wear glasses and didn't have great eyesight, how they could eliminate them out of the gene pool so there would ultimately be a, a whole group of people that didn't wear glasses. Hey, that would have been me. Yeah, yeah, that would have been a lot of us in this room. Okay? <laughs> A man would never do that. Man has done that. And we're living in a situation today where we're seeing it constantly being bombarded. And it sounds good. We're being compassionate. We're being, we're being understanding. And, and uh, you know, we're overpopulated. And we, we, we've got to make these selections. I'm glad God selected me. I've had God selected you. And you might be here this morning and say, well, I'm not a child of God. I'm not a Christian. Don't ever plan to be. I don't, you know, I do care, all right, about that. But I want you to understand one thing. No matter what your feeling is, no matter how you think, it's, it's really here regardless. God chose you, all right? Because if he didn't choose you, you wouldn't be here. Because he chose you before the foundation of the world ever was. So you're here because by his design. All right? Because he, he knew you had a purpose in this world. Despite all of these constant streams of death entertainment, the peddlers of such fair avoid the stark reality of actual death. They avoid the serious questions. 
But see, the Bible says once a man dies, then he faces judgment. There's no reincarnation. There's no second chance. There's no coming back. All right? I don't care how you want to come back. You don't, you don't come back to, in a higher life form. All right? I remember all the times that Nancy and I have been in India. Many times we have been in India. You know, the cows are running up and down the street. And I, I'm not against They believe what they believe. All right? But animals rule. Because they're convinced that through reincarnation, possibly one of their relatives has come back to a higher life form. That's their belief system. That's not mine. And I'm going to get to the reason I mentioned that here in just a moment. Death is serious. It's eternal business. Our culture promotes relativism. Man does what's right in his own eyes. So if I'm not hurting you, what, good, what, 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 what difference does it make? Can you imagine a drug addict shooting up and saying, listen, I'm not hurting you. This is just my body. Yeah, but you got a mom and you got a dad, you got a brother and you got a sister. Don't you think you're hurting them as well? Don't you think you're stealing something from them as, as well? Well, this is my body. I'm going to do what I want to do. It's like a married man going home to his wife and saying, hey, listen, I've been cheating on you for the last three or four months. You've been what? I've been cheating on you. You can't do that. It's my body. I want to do what I want to do. And it's not hurting you, is it? Well, yeah, it's hurting them. It, it kills them. It kills the relationship. It kills everyone that is involved in that relationship. And it goes extended, extended to aunts and nieces and nephews and cousins. And, and there seems to be no stop to it. But we're so convinced that if it's okay for me, it doesn't hurt anybody else, then it's all right. You're hurting the Creator God who created you and formed you to do good works and not to destroy your body. Yes. And we're living in a society, whatever feels good to it, doesn't work that way. You're hurting somebody. I told you I wasn't going to be politically correct today. Make no mistake. Live in a tough time. But aren't you glad that God has never changed and never will change? Amen. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So, Pastor, what does this have to do with miracles? It seems like everything you're talking about this morning is the opposite of miracles. What's it have to do with it? In Genesis chapter 1. I want you to look at some powerful few verses real quick. Genesis chapter 1, verse number 26, and verse number 27. Many of you may know this by heart. And once I start sharing it, you, you will know the fullness of all of it. In the beginning, amazing. Verse number 26, then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeping upon the earth. God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. And he made him, created male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth, and subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Powerful. And you and I realize that we have been created in the image of God. Having the image or the likeness God means very simple. You've been made to resemble God. Now, I know that our, our minds can't quite grab hold of that because we're trying to picture God with blue eyes or brown eyes, gray hair or uh, black hair or whatever. We're trying to picture that. But God said, I'm going to make you in my image. Now here's the image that, that God created us in. He said, you're going to be 
rational beings. Therefore, one of the things that being made in the image of God means is that man was made to be in a relationship. This is both vertical and horizontal components. Vertically, we are destined to be in a relationship with God. Horizontally, we're destined to be in a relationship one to another. So when someone tells me, well, Brother Paul, I don't need to go to church. Yes, you do too. And I'd be honored enough to say it. Yes, you do. Quit fooling yourself. Because we got two ways. We stay in a vertical relationship with God, and we stay in a horizontal relationship one with another. And we can't stay in that kind of a relationship if we don't ever fellowship one with another. That's how God created us. That's what the image of God is. God, the Son, and the Spirit were in a relationship with each other, and now they are in a relationship with man because they created us with his image. So I'm in a, a divine relationship with God the Father. I'm in a divine relationship with the Son. I'm in a divine relationship with the Holy Spirit, and their life now is in me, and I have the ability to channel their life in me, through me, and cast out death that is there in some of the Change your life. Sometimes when people say, well, they don't want to be changed, change them anyway. <laughs> Pray for them. Yes. My mom was determined to pray for me until I found Christ again after I'd strayed away. She didn't quit. Chased me down in the bars and every place else and prayed for me in front of everybody. Didn't care. Yes, she did. Very fond of here. I was 21 years old, sitting in a tavern. She came in, and had a friend of mine sitting there, her and my mom, and another lady came in. And, what are you doing in here? I'm 21 years old. I'm getting where I want to be. No, you won't either. Pulled me by my ear, twisted my ear, and broke me off. <laughs> Thank God for a great moment. Or I might still be sitting in some place like that. All right? I thought I was having a great time. <laughs> I'll tell you how long it took me to go back to that place. I'm so embarrassed. <laughs> Church, you better go to church. <laughs> I mean, to me, that's a no-brainer. 
job or in the car. How many tragedies have, have befallen friends that, that for whatever reason that, that they, you decided not to be with them or go with them or whatever? Listen, God loves you. God cares about you. God goes before you. God's hand is always upon you. One thing that we realize is that's a relationship with God. This is the very heart of the Christian gospel. The universe in which we live was created by a good, gracious Heavenly Father who filled it with good things to enjoy. And He created a moral law by which to structure our lives. But to know and be known by the Creator is the most powerful relationship one could ever have. Jeremiah talks about us, and John Piper makes a statement. He said in his book called Desiring God, he explains that God has designed each of us with an intimate desire to pursue happiness and to flourish. The problem is not that we seek pleasure. The problem is that we seek pleasure from idols from outside of our relationship with God. Hey, God doesn't want us to live a boring life. He doesn't want to have, uh, us not to have any kind of joy or happiness or pleasure. All He wants is that we go through Him and allow Him to supply that joy in our life and not seek it outside of Him. And if we'll seek it from Him, He'll give us all the joy in the world. Scripture commands us, and that was found in Jeremiah 2 and 13, shares that. In Psalms 37 and 4, Scripture commands us to find delight in the Lord. The Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord.
scriptures assert that man was created in the image and the likeness of God Almighty. Amen. Period. Bottom line. If you've got any, if you've got any kind of a, if you've got any kind of scientific proof, yep. It's in the word. Well, that's just a book. No, it's not. It's 66 books. Written by over 40 authors. Spanning a period of over 4,000 years. Kings, fishermen, tax collectors, shepherds, kings, paupers, wheat farmers. And over all that period of time, there's a golden river. You know what? They didn't confer with one another either. And all over that period of time, there's one thing that rings true from Genesis to Revelation. Jesus Christ came, died for you, that you might have life and have life abundantly and one day spend eternity with him in heaven. That is a thing that is all the way through. Impossible for man to do that today. Impossible for 40 different writers to, to write 66 books for every different background that could be named at that time over that period without consulting one another and come up with a book that has a theme and that theme is about your life and my life and eternal salvation and our time to stay with him. That be done. But it was done. That's all the proof I need. Plus all the miracles and signs and wonders I've seen in my life. So God created you in his image and his likeness. God is all knowledge, he's all present, he's all power. He's everywhere. He has all power. He knows all things. And there's portions of that that he's given to you. Well, how do you do that? Well, first of all, he gave you the discernment of the Holy Spirit that you could know things revealed by him. He gave you the power of the Holy Spirit that you could have all power operating in your life through the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Everywhere at one time, God is giving you and I the ability that our voices can be heard literally around the world. God has created us in His image and in His likeness. God created male and female and gave them their sexuality. Therefore, we must have those same qualities. We are His offspring. We want a God that accepts everything else. I don't know how you are this morning, but I want to accept the God of the This is the God that I want. Not what this world has told me he is, but what I know he is. And that's God. Praise the Now, I gave you a warning before I start that it wasn't going to be politically correct. And it's not. I'm concerned about people. I'm concerned about lost souls. I'm concerned about America. Because I know that if the church doesn't wake up and open their mouth, more and more people are going to be lost. Don't get mad at me when I tell you I love you and I want you to know the Lord. If I didn't love you, I could, I could care less. But because I do love you, I can't stay silent. I must tell you that Jesus Christ.
Those of you that don't know the Lord this morning,